I thought before I began to talk about the role of zoos in modern society, I would tell you a little bit about my background and how I got to the position that I decided I would talk about this. Um, so I'm a developmental biologist and I've studied reproductive biology, hormones, genetics for many, many years um, and introduced new courses. So I introduced developmental biology as a course at Edinburgh University for the first time. And really, as you do more and more research, you find out more and more and it's absolutely great fun. And I love doing things in my lab, but I found that I was also interested in lots of things across the university, particularly in how we could get young people from disadvantaged backgrounds to come to the university, how we could give our postgraduate students an experience which made them engage much more with the public and much more with schools. And I, I, so I decided I was doing more and more public engagement and more and more interaction with schools. And what you discover is that if you run a big lab, you need to be running that big lab. You need all the latest equipment, you need to be at the right talks, you need to be at the right conferences. But I actually thought I, what I was doing besides running my lab was having a bigger impact, if you like. We'd written um, resources for school teachers about stem cells and the ethics of stem cells around Charles Darwin and, and evolution. And these were being used across the UK by hundreds of school children. And, and the other thing was that when I did my research, it was incredibly competitive. And if I didn't get there first, somebody else had done it very soon thereafter. And I actually made a conscious decision to switch from doing basic fundamental research, fun as it is, to doing things across the whole university and trying to make strategic changes in the university to make us more accessible and more open to what the wider public. And so really it's coming from that kind of background that I want decided that I would talk to you today about the role of zoos. And what's happened is that I've essentially now um, I've partly retired and I work part time and I was eventually senior vice principal or deputy vice chancellor so I was running the university a lot of the time and I wanted to do a specific project and that was to spend my time setting up strategic partnerships across the city with institutions that had good access to the public and had an educational remit. So I've been setting up partnerships with the national galleries, with the national museums, um, talking to the libraries at the moment. And I guess a slightly more interesting one, or maybe not quite so expected, was that I decided we would have one with the Royal Zoological Society for Scotland. And so, although I think that my basic research is in developmental biology, um, I've always been interested in animals and I've been to the Kruger Park many times. I've travelled in Madagascar, I've been to the Galapagos Islands, I've been to Sri Lanka, all those things to photograph the wild animals. And so I, as I went, I became more and more aware of how difficult it is for people to live in some of those places and how difficult it is for there to be... Um, there's always conflicts between keeping the wild animals and the conservation and those people being able to grow their economies and have enough food and be healthy. And so there was lots and lots of issues going on. And so it seemed that actually the University of Edinburgh and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland could gain a lot from each other by working together. And so we decided to set up this partnership and then I decided that I actually didn't know anywhere near as much about zoos as I needed to know to be able to do this properly. And so I have now gone on the board of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland so that I can find out and I have learned a lot more. But what I've done for this presentation is to actually do some thinking and some research, if you like, about what, I, what zoos are for, whether we should have them, whether we shouldn't, and really, and what they might be doing now compared to what they used to do. 
And there's no right answers, I should tell you that before we start, that this is really open to debate. But what I wanted to do was tell you about some of the things I've thought about that I think might influence the way people think about zoos. But I do want to start by at least thanking a few people, and I shouldn't forget. First of all, Chris West and Jeremy Peat, who are the chief executive and the chair of the board of the zoo, who know that I'm giving this talk. Um, I do tend to give quite controversial talks sometimes, so they took a risk and agreed that I should do this. They also, um, I had various people who work at the zoo gave me lots of information. So Lee Morris, who was, is in charge of education, gave me a lot of pictures that I could select from. Um, there's somebody there called Ross Porter who sent me text about this big, about snails, and some pictures of snails you'll see later. Um, and one person, Joe Elliott, gave me all the food bills and the bedding bills for a year from the zoo so I could figure out how much it was costing really to keep these animals. So they gave me the accounts. And I also talked to one of the keepers who'd been out to Uganda to experience a conservation site related to the chimps who she looks after. So the zoo were very helpful in letting me do this, but they don't know what I'm going to say. And so I have to say that tonight I'm expressing my own views and they're not the views of the zoo or the University of Edinburgh, they're my take on things. So um, it's don't blame the university, don't blame the zoo if you don't like what I say. Um, so can I just ask how many of you have been to the zoo in, a zoo in the last year or so? Good, great. And how many of you went just as adults? Good. And how many of you went with children? Okay. So, so when you get when you went to the zoo, what were your favourite things? What what did you like best? Pandas. You like the pandas, penguins, <laughs> penguins. <laughs> the hippos, right? Okay. So there's quite a good variety. Nobody said the snakes or the insects. I noticed that. Um, so have you been to any other establishments like um, sea life centres or UK safari parks or aquariums? Yes. Yeah, you've been to everything, okay. And some of you, yeah, good. So, so you have a general interest in, in wildlife and animals. And so I think that, I think people do have a, an interest in wildlife and in animals. And it's there that I really want to start from. And originally, whoops, um, the Victorians were intensely interested in animals. But at the time, there was not much travel and they were seen as exotic creatures. And actually, people set up zoos and they, they were set up like botanical gardens. They were zoological gardens and they were there for people to go and see the animals. And that's exactly what they were for. And it, there was not much attention to pay the way they were dis displayed. They were just in their cages and people went to see them. But nonetheless, millions of people went to see these exotic animals, which they had only heard about very few people travelled then, and very few people had seen these animals. So the zoo was the first time they'd got to see the animals. And of course, it wasn't new to keep wild animals in captivity. Um, and many had been kept, and many are totally unsuitable as pets, um, in many locations across the world, often as symbols of power. So this is just the site of the zoo at Edinburgh, just as an example. And these are very old pictures, so you can't really see other than the shape. And it's just, it's just a farm, essentially. It was a farm with some fields with different kinds of sheep in them, etc. And then suddenly, in Victorian times, a new drawing came and it was a zoological park and was going to be a zoological park and the animals would start to move in, originally around the housing enclosures and across the, that area. But that's still the site that Edinburgh Zoo has. 
and it's a relatively small site for the kinds of animals that have been kept there. So it's not a big zoo, um, but it's obviously the biggest one in Scotland and it's considered to be one of the best ones in the UK. And they certainly look after their animals very well compared to the way the Victorians did for sure. So um, these are some of the pictures of the Victorians visiting the zoo. So the hippo was just in a cage. The lions were of, sometimes in rows of cages with some other animals above them sometimes or below them. And as you can, as you can see, there was no attempt to show their environment just to show the animals. And this is, as I said, what the Victorians liked. And, but at the same time, people and young children are absolutely fascinated by being able to see wild animals, uh, or often any animals. And it does stimulate an excitement in the natural world. And that is then very important for cons conservation and other things, for protecting animals. And these interests are maintained by many adults, probably often started off by visiting zoos and wildlife parks or even um, <coughs> some of the farms and things you can visit now. So I think that they, this is still very much true. And these are just some recent pictures from Edinburgh Zoo. And the kids, you can see, are totally captured at all times, whether it's the penguins or whether they're trying to find a bird or whether they're in with the pelicans or whether they're in the education centre learning about how to handle animals. So these are quite genuine enthusiasms and you only have to look at the faces of, of kids and young people at the zoo to, make sure, to know that they really make a connection with animals. So, a lot of things have changed, though, since the Victorians had zoos. And one of the things which is really quite different <coughs> are all the wildlife TV and the documentaries. And, you know, before, people really didn't <coughs> know much about animals in their own habitat. But now, there's lots of these documentary programmes, and people do understand a lot more about wild animals <coughs> and how they live. And these are really quite amazing <coughs> programs and they really make a huge difference. And along with those programs have gone lots, come along a lot more research activities. So people know a lot more now about animal behaviour in the wild and how animals live together in different groups. And they don't live together very often in this, in the typical way that people thought of in Victorian times, it's not like Noah's Ark. They don't often live two of everything um, nicely next to each other all year. There's a lot of behavioural differences between different animals. Some animals will live in quite large groups. Sometimes it's mostly males with a few females. Sometimes it's differently. Sometimes there's one group lives together and some males live separate or vice versa. The care of the young is quite different. So sometimes the males look after the young, sometimes it's the females, sometimes they share, sometimes the whole group shares. So people know so much more now about wild animals and how they live. And therefore things in zoos are changing and changing quite fast. Because these things start to tell people about how to look after those animals and welfare conditions and what kind of conditions they came from and therefore the kinds of conditions they'd be more likely to be able to survive in and, and be looked after properly. And I, I should say that there are other conflicts. There are conflicts, as I said, for the need for the development of human populations and maintaining places for wild animals. And these conflicts really in impinge and affect the habitats for animals, leading to loss of species. And really, this isn't, there isn't a right and a wrong answer here because these groups of people are trying to 
grow things to feed families or raise enough money to feed families. But a lot of it has read, led to deforestation of areas where wild animals live or the destruction of habitat. And there's still quite a lot of things that happen, even though they're now illegal, like hunting rhino and elephants for their tusks to grind up to make me pretend medicines for um, Eastern Europe, essentially, and Japan and places like that. And although these things have theoretically halted, we know that they haven't. Um, and so over the past hundred years, the size of the human population has doubled, but the number of species has been reduced by 50%. So these are really quite stark figures that as so the um, conflict between humans and moving into agriculture and spaces for wild animals and being able to live such that you maintain all the species is really, really very closely correlated. And even for tourism, there's a conflict here because all these programs have stimulated people so they want to go and see these wild animals. But sometimes that in itself can affect the habitat. And some, um, sometimes there's too many visitors and some governments have started to restrict the number of people that can go to certain places. And there's also climate change going on, which is adding to all this and increasing the loss of species. So it's at the point now where it's quite a lot of species, the only examples left are actually in zoos. So this is really quite a significant issue. Um, but at the same time as doing all this, uh, questioning of the ethical, um, ethical questions, essentially, should we be keeping wild animals in captivity? Um, are now being asked much more often particularly primates. And it is the case that a lot of things that people thought originally were unique to humans aren't so unique to humans. So there's a lot of evidence now that animals in the wild have their own personalities. They can communicate effectively. They can learn. They use tools. So virtually everything that at one point in the past people thought was unique to humans actually isn't one or other group of primates uses these things. So with all this going on, do we need zoos? And if we do need them, what are they for? What should they be like? What should be in them? And who are they for? So those are the kinds of questions that I want to just talk a little bit about. So most modern zoos think they're, uh, consider that they're about conservation, research, and education. Those are their main three things that they're trying to do. However, there's a real balancing act because zoos are commercial enterprises and they've got to be run as a business and customers pay, so customers expect to get an experience that they like. And you can imagine that it's extremely expensive to build the kind of enclosures that are going to at least partially reproduce the environment those animals would live in in the wild. And can you imagine how much it costs to feed so many animals all the year round, all the different types, and keep some hot and some cold, and there's so many things that have to be sought about. Running a zoo is really expensive. Now, most zoos are registered charities, but the income they take from people coming through the gate has to cover all sorts of expenses, including the research and including working with communities in the countries where the wild animals come from, working with other zoos, education, all sorts of other things, as well as looking after those animals, as well as they possibly can be looked, at, looked after. And the government doesn't generally give money to zoos. So the Botanic Garden gets money from Edinburgh City Council, the zoo doesn't. 
the zoo is a commercial organisation, even though it's a registered charity. So they also need to fundraise, which they do um, either by either for some of their specific research projects or um, by enhancing visitors' experiences or having extra things, and from philanthropy as well. So there's really a big balancing act for any zoo, not just the zoos in Edinburgh, between attracting visitors, getting money in, and being able to pay for conservation, education and research, as well as looking after and showing the animals. So this, this is a real, really significant balancing act. And I, I, what I want to do now is spend a little bit of time on how what the zoos are doing um, Im have impact in the wider community. And I'll look at a bit about how the types of animals they're keeping has been changing over the years and has changed quite a lot. And really how the zoos that are helped by finding out more about wild animals in certain situations, but also by working with communities in different countries to try to educate and understand more and work with them to understand conservation. Most of the examples I'm going to use, just to give you specific examples, are from Edinburgh, from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, because that's our Scottish organisation. And I just need to remind you that they run two sites. They run Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park. Has anybody been to Highland Wildlife Park? OK, good. A few of you, great. So these are the two... These are ex some pictures of the two main sites. So they're really quite different sites. And I'm going to come back to this a bit more at mo in a moment. But Edinburgh Zoo is involved in conservation projects across the world. Um, and these are, this, these are some of the things that they're doing. Around the, there's maps of the world. And they show that they've got field teams and people working really across the globe. So some of the projects involve the Brazilian um, pan, 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 Pantanal, which is where the armadillos are being looked after. There's quite a lot in Uganda around the chimps. And in Southeast Asia, there's tigers and much more. So I, I, I don't want to give you hundreds of lists, but they, they're working across the world to do a lot of things. And then I want to show you a bit more about um, the number of species they have that are under threat. So in <coughs> Edinburgh Zoo, they keep 166 different species and over 5,000 animals, but 50% of those are under some kind of threat um, as a species. So they already have issues in the wild. So a lot of the animals that are kept are ones that are under threat. And the Highland Wildlife Park, instead of being that tiny little space that there is on the edge of Edinburgh for the zoo, the Highland Wildlife Park is big. It's got 80 hectares. And so this is a great place for showing off animals that need a lot of space, that don't mind being cold, um, and that actually can showcase, if you like, Scottish wildlife because they're right there, Scotland's right behind them. And so, but even there, even, and even though they've not got very many animals, that, because most of them are quite big ones, um, again, 50% of them are under some kind of threat. So, so they are, they have moved largely towards keeping animals that have got some kind of environmental issues. And they haven't got one of everything anymore. And I know people are disappointed sometimes when they go to a zoo and there aren't any giraffes or there aren't any elephants. But it's, um, I personally believe it's better if the elephants can all go somewhere where at least they can live in a community and they have the right kind of um, space and the same for the giraffes that they would have and that the different zoos focus and concentrate on different kinds of animals. And so what's actually done by zoos in terms is really quite different. And 
So I'm going to mention a couple of conservation projects, one of which is centred in Scotland and one which is in Uganda, one which is centred on the Highland Wildlife Park and one which is run from Edinburgh Zoo. So can I start by seeing, asking if anybody's seen a wildcat? Okay. Um, did you see it in the wild? Has anybody seen a wild cat in the wild? Yes? How did you know it was a wild cat? Well, it was up in the mountains in West Virginia, so I'm pretty sure it was wild. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so in Scotland, there's a very specific set of issues around wild cats, the Highland wild, wild cat. And I think that this is... I think this is a complicated problem and I can see that it got there, uh, it got to this situation for a number of reasons and a lot of things have conspired together. So first of all there is loss of native habitat, so that's happened and some of the farmers have poisoned the wildcats, so there has been loss of them by poisoning. This is farmers and landowners. And the third thing relates actually to our love of domestic cats. And domestic cats have been brought to the Highlands and then they're, re then they're accidentally or intentionally released and they become feral cats and they've been breeding with the wild cats, diluting <coughs> the population of wild cats and affecting their genetics. So the gene pool of those wild cats is shifting as well so that they're a mix now of wild cats and feral cats. So the very rare and elusive real wild cat in Scotland um, is being, if you like, looked after and tr they've been trying to rescue it in the Highland Wildlife Park. And this is one of the conservation programmes which is going on. And it involves captive breeding of the wildlife of the cats. And with the ultimate view of possibly releasing them back into the wild. But the re programme requires quite a lot of space to grow the cats and new young animals to continue with the breeding programme. And it's really, really crucial that they have a genetically diverse pool because as you'll, you'll n probably know that genetically, if the number of um, animals in a species gets too small, there's too much inbreeding and then you get lots of problems, lots of defects, lots of um, errors. And so you want that genetically for them to be as varied as possible. And this requires a lot of collaboration. It requires different communities to talk to each other. So there's very, very carefully maintained stud books for all the cats in this breeding program, all the records of birth, everything known about the parents. And in fact, wild cats push away their young, usually about the end of the year when they've been brought in, born in the spring. And as part of this breeding program, for example, if it's a male, the, that cat will be then moved to another population. And where it gets moved will depend upon its genetics, whether the population that it's being moved to has got space and capacity for a wild cat and as I said whether there's a female there that's genetically different and so some of them go to um, the Allerdale Wild, uh, Wilderness Park who are collaborating and a part of the program. So that's really just to tell you that there is a program going on trying to save the Scottish wild cat um, and possibly in the future reintroduce it. Now, the other one I want to tell you about is something called Bodongo. And this is one of the projects which the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland funds in Uganda. But if you go to Edinburgh Zoo, you'll see that the chimp enclosures, where the chimps are kept, is called Bodongo. And it's called Bodongo because that's where, those, where chimps live in the wild. And there's a lot of work going on in conservation in Bodongo as well, and that can help with um, what goes on in the zoo. So I want to tell you just a little bit about one of the people from Edinburgh Zoo who, as a development opportunity, got to go to Bodongo 
and see the chimps in the wild and work with their field station that looks after this area with the chimps. And the field station has monitored chimps there for over 10 years and they, they look at all the species in the forest, not just the chimps. They know what they eat, they know what they live, where they live, they know how many are in each group. Sorry, I forgot to show you all the pictures of the wild cats and the conservation projects. So the, and the wild cat, there's lots of activities for, for young children as well um, about uh, getting involved with this and protecting the wild cat. So this is, um, these are the people who work on the field station in Budongo in Uganda. And as I said, they've been looking at the forest and how the chimps operate for over 10 years. And one of the things they've found is that the forest has changed. And instead of producing loads of fruit, it's producing more nuts and seeds and much less fruit. But the chimps have adapted to that, so they forage much more on the ground and they're eating nuts and bark and leaves in a different way. But the, the field station is doing what it can with the local population as well. And one of the real problems in the area is, has been poaching and hunters. And what they've done is they've hired some of the poachers and turned them into trackers. Now the people who used to be hunters know exactly where the traps are likely to have been put and exactly how to deal with the traps if, they've, um, if they need to remove them. So it's actually illegal for, for traps to be set within this conservation area, but nonetheless they're there and the trackers go out all the time, find the traps and remove them. And in the context of this, I mean, I should say that the traps are put out, they're not put there to, to catch the chimps, they're put there to catch small antelopes. But the chimps and the monkeys, if they walk through them, get caught as well. So it's, it's, they're not trying to catch them, but they're not supposed to set them up in the park, to, in the park at all. Um, so, but I need to say that 60% of the Uganda population is unemployed. They have got to find ways somehow of making a living and of being able to feed themselves and their families. So they are in conflict with the chimps. It's hard, they're hard things to decide what to do. And particularly around the edges of the bits of forest that are left and the bits of forest can be getting smaller and smaller, They've set up their crops and they do set up some really nasty traps around the edges because they don't want the chimps to come out and steal their crops, essentially. So, but the chimps learn, they learn quite fast. So the chimps have now got a call which says, I've seen a trap. So they've got an alarm call for a trap. And the older populations of chimps about 60% of them have got wounds and injuries from having been caught in traps at various points in time. Now they've got the alarm call and there's trackers out taking traps away as well. That's down to about 10% in the younger chimps. So the combination of getting help from the local population to preserve these areas and keep them free of traps and the chimps learning is actually protecting them. So when so the people from when the on the field station go and they follow the chimps and they see what they're doing, learn about their behaviour. And that's actually quite useful for learning how to look after the chimps when they're back at the zoo. And so you think, for example, they some of them were eating clay, and it turns out that the eating of the clay helps with parasites. And they've been offering some clay to some of the animals at Edinburgh Zoo now and they seem to think it's quite a good idea but they didn't know before that maybe they should offer them clay um, and it they also learn and they're also giving them more nuts and leaves and things now not just fruit so they do learn from going on these trips and bring, bring it back to improve the welfare of the animals at the zoo um, but I do need to say that chimps aren't always absolutely lovely they were they do Although they mostly eat um, nuts and fruit, 
they will chase and kill monkeys and eat them every so often. So they are hunters as well. But the destruction of the forest area is very high and some of the chimps now are almost completely isolated by agricultural land. And way, the way they, their reproduction works in the wild is that the female chimps will go to another group and I don't know how they're going to get there in some of these places anymore. Um, but as I said, people locally have got to be able to eat and they've got to earn a living. So one of the things that, that people are doing is trying to help them with perhaps choosing crops that the chimps don't like so that then they won't be tempted to come out of the forest and steal their crops. So there's a lot that can be done. Uh, apparently at the moment they don't like carrots. So they can, so some of them are suggesting they grow carrots. I'm not sure whether it's really that they don't like carrots or because they're hidden under the ground and once they've figured where they are they might take them. But for the moment carrots seem like oh, they're okay. Um, so I think that this just shows you that you, you need to be doing things in the wild, but you can learn from it as well. And I think this leads me into animal welfare and the fact that animals need the right kind of space, the right kind of food, they need stimulation, they need to be in the right groups, the right mix of ages, the right mix of sex, so that what they've got is much more close to a natural population. But that requires a lot of research, a lot of behavioural studies in the wild and in captivity. And one of the most crucial things is how well the animals are kept is going to determine whether they breed successfully or not. And if you can imagine back to those Victorian cages, it must have been not incredibly stressful for those animals. One being in this tiny little cage when you've been wandering around in open spaces. But not only that, can you imagine if you're a zebra and you're sat right opposite this lion? For both of them, one wants to chase the other one and eat it and the other one wants to run away and they're just stuck. So you have to also have the right, not just have the right enclosures for the animals, but you have to think about what they can see as well as you being able to see them. So it is much more complicated than certainly the Victorians thought. So the question is which animals should be kept and most zoos and wildlife parks need to make this decision for themselves and I think most of them have now moved away from this approach of having two of everything but and concentrating on specific species and the more they focus and concentrate the more likely they are to have success with breeding the animals because they know much more about them. But the question is, should it just be those species that need conserving? Or should it include, say, groupings of animals that would normally be seen together in the wild? So there's lots of different ways you could approach thinking about, if you're going to keep them, what kind of conditions it should be. And so I, I think the, the bottom line is that they if they're going to be kept, they have to be in the right kind of enclosures with the right space and having lots of experienced staff who know about them. But of course, all these things cost more. And coming back to the fact that Edinburgh's got, Ed, the Royal Zoological Society has got two sites, Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park, they can do quite different things on those two sites. So one of them can be really about putting wildlife in the Scottish context and the other about conservation and projects with different countries. So they can be quite different things. And the other thing is visitors. So visitors are perfectly happy to go to the Highland Wildlife Park, knowing it will pour with rain, knowing it will snow, and they don't mind. But in Edinburgh, as soon as the weather's bad and it rains, the visitor numbers completely plummet. So the, but on the other hand, the Edinburgh Zoo site being close to the city, has thousands more visitors than ever go to the Highland Wildlife Park. And so there's all these things to be weighed up as well. So it really, the other thing is that it's a balancing act between having the animals in enclosures they like, and a lot of them like and are now get the opportunity to go out when they want. So they've got an indoor space and an outdoor space. And people appreciate that. But then they might moan that they can't see the animal up close or it's not gone out today. So, you know, it, it again is this balancing act between people being able to see 
what they want to see and the animals being able to do what they want to do, which is hide sometimes. Um, there's quite a lot of, so these are just some of the pictures from uh, Uganda, from Bodongo. So these are people going out tracking through the forest to try to find traps. This is one of the chimp groups being followed. And these were the ones that were having some new behaviours that they'd not really known about before, of foraging on the floor for nuts <coughs> and eating tree bark and things. So these are the things that were brought back. And the other thing that zoos have started to do, and I think this is actually quite good if you like animals and you want to get close to them, is they've started developing some enclosures you can go into with the animals. So the one, some of the ones they've got at Edinburgh Zoo, there's some with wallabies that you can go through. The ringtail lemurs is the most recent one that's open, so you can go right in with them, and the pelicans as well. So these are, if you want to get up close to the animals, these are the enclosures to go to. The animals have a choice. They don't have to come out if they don't want to. But they actually quite, seem to quite like the interactions and I think are, are quite prepared to interact with people. It's still a please don't touch because they could bite still. Um, they probably wouldn't, but they could. Um, the pelicans did get a bit overexcited initially. <laughs> And, and people aren't always very sensible. Um, there was one of the zoos down in um, Yorkshire, apparently with some people had been with a safari drive through, some people had actually got out of their cars in the bit where the lions are wild, to st or were leaning out of their cars to see if they could touch the lions and things. So, you know, people aren't always very sensible about these things, they really aren't. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about primates because I think this is one of the big areas which isn't quite clear what people should do and the added complexity of trying to keep animals which are so closely related to humans which is probably even worse than the complexities around keeping some of the other wild species. And um, I don't think there's going to be any consensus about this. I think people are going to think completely different things. But nonetheless, there is an issue around whether we keep primates or not. Um, I want to just mention that once a year, all zoos have to count all their animals. And I think these, pi these pictures are from London Zoo, but I think it just shows how interactive the animals are with their keepers. Because I'm, I'm sure that some of them are checking whether they're on the list or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, and some animals are much easier to count than others. Obviously, they actually know how many they've got of the bigger things, everybody does. But trying to count all the beetles or trying to count all the penguins when they decide to go for a swim and come back and join the end of the queue again um, is not so easy. And especially the very small invertebrates where really you have to just have a general feel for the population. But one of the things about having all these is that it, there are very, very careful records of births and deaths and which animals are kept. And these are really important for breeding programs. And this lets there be international sharing of data and across the world, and there's a lot of sharing in Europe, which can really help with breeding of, disadvantage, of um, rare animals and ones that are under threat. And this is just some of the facts that I got from the guy who has to look after them. So the bottom line is that there's a lot of very specific mouths to feed. And you have to have mangoes in the middle of winter and you have to have everything that they need all the time. And so the annual cost of fruit in 2015 was 130,000 pounds. Okay, so a lot of money. They munch their way through over 600 grams of sweet potatoes and 330 kilograms of melon. So they get through a lot. And there's also different kinds of feeds, pellets of different kinds of food, supplements, juices, meat, and much, much more. So the, the total for the, for the fruit and veg, just for the fruit and veg, was over 2,000 pounds in one 
I think that was one week. So, you know, there's, there's huge amounts of stuff that you have to buy to keep those animals going. So I just really wanted to say that looking after all those exotic animals is, is expensive and has to be done right. You can't take shortcuts. So I want to just mention a couple of um, kinds of research projects that are done. Um, one of them, so I've tried to use different pro um, examples for conservation, for research, for education. So for one of the research projects, I might want, I'm going to mention pandas. Edinburgh Zoo is trying really hard to breed their pandas. The pandas are a major attraction. They're on loan from China. And the Chinese government decides which pandas you get. Okay, so the Chinese government decides who can have a panda and which ones you're going to get. And there's lots and lots of pandas around the world which zoos are trying to breed successfully from because they are very threatened in the wild. They are, um, so they do need to find ways to breed more pandas. But it's not easy because they don't really know very much about the reproductive behaviour of the pandas. So in order to do quite, to hope to work towards successful breeding, Edinburgh Zoo and other zoos monitor the behaviour of the pandas all the time with cameras to see how they're behaving, what's going on. And I should say that talking to other zoos is also quite useful, whether they've had a successful breeding or not. But a lot is being done now on the reproductive biology and collaboration with scientists, reproductive biologists at the University of Edinburgh. So they know a lot more now about what's going on with the hormones in the panda at different stages of the reproductive cycle and when the pandas are losing um, the cubs during the course of um, the pregnancy. And that may help in the long run with having pandas that give rise to a, an actual cub. Now, there are a few issues. For example, in the wild, pandas don't live together. The male, the female, doesn't interact with the male apart from for about one day a year. And normally when she's ready for reproduction, a whole load of males show up and she chooses which one she wants. Whereas at Edinburgh, she's got one choice. And actually, she doesn't seem to like him very much. So all of the attempts at um, having a cub have come from artificial insemination. Both the pandas are perfectly healthy, they're in good shape, they've got no diseases, they're, so there's no, there's no reason why they shouldn't reproduce. But the data collected across the world and from China suggests that two-thirds of pre pregnancies from pandas do not go to fruition. So the fact that Edinburgh's had about three goes it doesn't mean anything that they've not bred yet. And the pandas are in the most northerly place they've ever been allowed. So they are quite different in a different environment. So by working together, these um, groups across the world should perhaps be able to find ways to more successfully breed the pandas. Now, it's just an interesting byproduct, but they needed to start doing research on bamboo as well to see which which bamboos the pandas like best and what they eat. So it breeds other research projects. I, and I want now to tell you about another program which is called Living Links. And this is a program which is at Edinburgh Zoo and it's studying monkeys in captivity. And there are two species of monkeys involved, the brown capuchins and the common squirrel monkeys. And these are very intelligent species. So they, they're normally found in the Brazilian Amazon basin, and they live on the forest floor foraging for food. Um, they mostly eat nuts and leaves, but they will eat the odd frog or um, something they find. Now, they're very clever monkeys, so that when, when they find food, they give out a call and the whole group goes to feed, but the dominant monkeys start to take all the food. But the subordinate monkeys are getting a bit more clever. So they put out an alarm call, which says that a bird of prey is coming or something like that. So the dominant monkeys run away and then they go and get the food. <laughs> so these are quite smart monkeys. And so these were the ones that um, 
people thought that would be good to study at Edinburgh. And they're looking at the psychology and behaviour of these monkeys working together in groups. And there's an interesting aspect to this is that the researchers are also watched. So all of the research that's done is on view to the public. So the uh, monkeys are invited in to do their psychological learning experiments. They don't have to come, but if they do come, the public can watch them and they can see what's going on. So the researchers are being observed as well as the monkeys. And they get rewards for taking part, but they don't get punished if they don't take part. So I just want to mention a couple of things that people have found out. First of all, in the wild, they've been se found seen to be rubbing really smelly things into each other. And they, in Edinburgh Zoo, what they do is they'll take onions and they'll rub them all into each other. And this is a group activity. And so they get to the parts that you can't get to on your own, a bit like being helped with your suntan cream. Um, but they think this is to stop mosquito bites and parasites, etc. So, and it's a very sociable gathering and a group activity. And the other thing they've found is that all the animals have different personalities. And unlike people sometimes say opposites attract for humans, for the monkeys, it seems like they get on best with the ones that are most like them. So they seem to be more sociable with ones that are very similar to them. And so these, these were just the pandas, and these are the, the capuchins on the left. The one um, just eating some food and one doing an experiment, and then the squirrel monkeys that they live alongside. And now I just want to mention this. This is a picture from India, and I think it just reminds us how little we know and understand about primates. And what happened was this... Um, primate adopted, if you like, a puppy. Now the puppy was a stray and it was getting attacked with other, by, other, by other stray dogs. And this female decided to look after the puppy. And the puppy was perfectly happy and she would offer it grapes before she would eat and people were putting out food for them and the, actually the dog preferred the people the people food to the grapes and apparently the only thing it really objected to was when she took it up in the tree at night to sleep. <laughs> um, so I don't really know what's going on here. Um, you know, was it, was, she, was it a surrogate child? Um, was she res did she rescue it because it was being attacked out of pity? Um, or was it a pet? So, you know, I think there's so much we don't understand about primates that I think, well, I just wanted to show you that there are, there were, there have been fables through the years of animals of one species looking after another species, but this is a, a modern day version of that which was perfectly true. So, the next thing I want to do quickly is ask you where do you think the zoos get their animals? Where do you think they come from? Yeah, mostly from other zoos. So not very often from the wild anymore. They do mostly come from other zoos. <coughs> but the breeding program is the most important thing to stop inbreeding. So there's lots and lots more sharing between the zoos now. And there are some animals now that are really only, very only, are really rarely seen in the wild and in zoos, these species are all zoos that have been, they're all species that have been saved by zoos essentially from going extinct. Everything from wolves to Californian condor, but there are also some little things, some butterflies, etc. It's not all big fancy species. And lemurs, different kinds of tortoises. So, you know, there's a lot of things that have been saved, if you like, by zoos looking after them. And now I, t I want to tell you about this snail release program. And in Tahiti, there was an issue that these uh, snails were beginning to be extinct. And these, these small snails 
are called parchulous snails and they were, everybody knew they were going extinct. So in about 1984, some groups of people went round and collected some up and then for 30 years they bred them in zoos till they'd got enough of them with complicated programs enough and then they went out and released them and this is them releasing them back. Now the problem is that there's, an in, that there's a snail, a bigger snail that eats, the little, that eats these species of snails. So when they've been reintroduced, they've had to be reintroduced into protected government areas. They haven't reintroduced them everywhere because the snail that predate, it, that's the predator is still around. So I think that um, these are quite interesting that these snails have been released back into the wild. So on the um, education side, I think that there's lots again going on in the zoos. And the, I'll go actually back. There's one particular program that I think would, is very relevant here. And the zoo, in collaboration with a number of organisations, if I can find which ones, the Clydesdale Bank supports a, a lot of it, but there's a number of other partners as well. The zoo has a bus, essentially, and it goes out to local schools and local communities. And for P, um, I think it's P4 to P7, there's various programs, one about mini beasts and beavers, and one about wildcats. And if you want the zoo to come to the primary school, these kind of things can be arranged and maybe they've already been, but if not and you want them, either let the zoo know or you can tell me and we can arrange for these classroom activities. And it's really to introduce school children at an early age to Scottish native animals. And the bus is a fantastic way of taking education out to other areas because the zoo is on fixed sites. So in general, people have got to come to the zoo, but there needs to be ways for the zoo to go out. So on site, there's lots of activities for children at both sites, and there's growing numbers of activities for adults as well to interact with animals. And there's lots of CPD, lots of things for teachers to help them explain conservation. And as I said, there's lots going on in different countries. Now, I want to just really finish up by mentioning the complexities of returning species to the wild mm. and the complexities of removing alien species that are causing problems in other countries. They're, they're closely related and not everything under threat is big and fluffy. There's lots of small things under threat, for example, like the snails. And there's partnerships across the world trying to do these things together. So there's been some partnerships trying to eradicate some of the mice that were eating albatross chicks and eggs and they, the mice were artificially introduced into these islands. And also trying to look after rockhopper penguins in certain areas. So there's lots of these kind of activities across the world trying to decide what to do. And I've mentioned the wildcats and possibly thinking about whether they can be returned to the wild. And there's lots and lots of issues here because if you have looked at the press recently, there's quite a lot of controversy about beavers in Scotland. So beavers were, in, re, in, beavers were hunted to extinction. They weren't there anymore. And they were reintroduced to an area of the River Tay. And without it saying that one's right and one's wrong, the conservationists are really happy, they're doing really well, they're breeding, and the farmers want to shoot them because they're building dams and destroying tr trees. And so um, there's a big dilemma there about what, what will happen with these reintroduced beavers. Um, so I want to just tie, finish up, if you like, by returning to why we're partnering with the zoo. And I think the zoo gets an awful lot of things out of it. They get expertise to academics in hundreds of disciplines. They're very small organisations. They can have reproductive biologists, they can have people who know about architecture and building certain kinds of enclosures. They can have people who know about health and well-being, about 
what animals need for food or the vets. So there's a huge amount can be done there about animal welfare. And the value to the university is that we're keen on education, we're keen on getting out to other groups of people. Um, and we can give our students real life experiences, if you like. They can go and do real projects at the zoo, which will make a difference. Um, so I think it's a good collaboration on both sides. But I think it's really to say that, again, that there's no clear answers about whether we should or would, whether we shouldn't have zoos. I don't think everybody's going to agree, but I hope I've given you a few things to think about and I would very much welcome hearing your ideas, particularly around which animals should they keep? Should it just be those under threat? Um, if some are reintroduced and the species is saved, what should happen to all the ones that are still in the zoos? They can't be reintroduced into the wild, a lot of them, because they've never been in the wild. They would be dead within next to no time. So there's lots and lots of things to think about. You can't just return things to the wild when you, when you think you've done your job. And I think there's other things to think about, like what are the boundaries between keeping animals as pets, keeping them for agriculture, and keeping them in zoos? So those are another set of boundaries to start thinking about. Um, I looked back through history and found that at one time Edinburgh University had a pet humour. Um, and people today sometimes keep completely inappropriate things as pets. There have been issues in Florida where because people have kept snakes and then they've got too big so they just put them in the sewerage and then they appear somewhere and cause havoc. Or crocodiles, that's been done for. Um, and, in, and there are lots of cultural differences. So in some countries, people think it's perfectly okay to keep a lemur tied up by its leg in a tree in your garden. Um, so there are lots of cultural differences. And there are now people in this country that keep exotic reptiles. Some can look after them, some can't. And there's even quite a few examples of people going to vets, my daughter's a vet, with meerkats. Now they shouldn't be able to have a meerkat but they have meerkats, and the meerkats live in very complicated family groups. They don't live on their own. And so how do we cope with interacting with the public to try to educate them, if you like, about conservation and about animal welfare and what you should and shouldn't try to keep as a pet? So there's lots of dilemmas and lots of um, things that need to be done if animals aren't going to become extinct. Um, but, whilst, and, but in doing that, we need to maintain the enthusiasm, I think, for people, of people for animals and being able to interact with them. So I'm not going to tell you, what, I'm not going to give you an, a definitive answer, but just open lots of questions. And I want to finish by saying, if we had the technology, should we bring back already extinct animals? <laughs> so this is an exhibition which was done at um, Edinburgh Zoo of dinosaurs. So if we could do it, should they be brought back? Obviously, I, know, I think on this one I'd, th I'd say no. But, <laughs> but, but I think that not everybody does and there's been lots of films about this. So anyway, that's just to give you lots of things to think about. Personally, the thing that worries me most is that people have them yes. when they don't know how to look after them. So they often end up in the vets when it's too late, <coughs> when it's too late. I'm sure there are some people that keep them in wonderful conditions, but they are, as you say, still captive and that's things will, people will come down on different sides of the argument for whether you should have those, whether you should have captive animals or not. Personally, I wouldn't keep a reptile. Actually, that's a lie. I've got a tortoise that's 65 years old. <laughs> and I'm not setting him free to get attacked by a fox. <laughs>
rather than zoos. Zoos haven't, in general, had the capacity to do much with fish. But yes, there are lots of fish that are becoming <coughs> extinct as well. And there's lots of arguments, again, about um, breeding certain kinds of fish for food in Scotland and wh what happens if they escape, etc. And there's also lots of issues about people going fishing and then throwing back the, the catch they're not allowed to bring ashore in completely the wrong space. And so introducing alien species into different environments where they could cause problems. So yes, the sea I just haven't talked about yet. Well, I think one of the things is we, we can't see into the future to know the impact of what we're doing. We can see that there's a lot of species going extinct and that we've caused it by taking away their habitats. Is that part of evolution? Well, yes, it is because they've gone. Relevant to the planet as a whole. I mean, I don't I disagree with what we're doing to the forest, but is that part of evolution? You can see it that way, um, but, and, and it is. Want. Yeah, well, I mean, it is the way humans are behaving is altering evolution, not just for us, but for other species. So that is definitely the case. Um, the question is how much we should intervene when we've got the capacity to do so. And personally, I think it would be rather bad to carry on destroying the planet without at least attempting to... Um, interact with people to try to do what you can but take but still but being sensitive to the fact that people in developing countries do need to be able to live that that they're not in the position we're in in the west well i think yeah i well i think that is a real balancing act i think the thing is i think at the moment working with all the governments in some of these other countries they're not ready yet to protect their animals and so i think people some people believe that the zoo programs are helping to protect against these things in the interim but both things cost an, an absolute fortune there's no doubt about it and and you really don't know when you reintroduce them into the wild how well they're going to do and sometimes when you want sometimes another species has taken the niche that animal was in before and so there isn't necessarily a space for it anymore if you see what I mean so it is quite complicated they are very complicated not just the breeding program but I think it's I haven't really didn't have time to talk about that very much but the whole concept of re removing alien species and reintroducing to the wild has to be taken on a case-by-case -case issue and there's no point in doing it if they don't stand a chance when you put them back. Yeah, and you are dealing with the fact that big furry cuddly things get a lot more support than some other things. So. The people love the pandas, um, and there's probably less people that love snails, but nonetheless, some people do. Well, I think wolves back in Scotland, I think the answer is it's not impossible, but the, the, it's, it's policy makers as well, so it's not just whether it can be done, it's whether the different lobby groups, who's going to win? The farmers who wouldn't want them, um, or people who are interested in conservation who would want them. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it's perfectly possible. But the, like the beavers, yeah. But I don't know how the beavers are going to fare. Now, they're back, but I don't know how they'll <coughs> fare. Probably yes. I mean, I, d I didn't really have time to go into it, but there's quite a lot of good evidence that um, having interactions with animals is good for human health and well-being. 
So it's good for people to interact with animals. They feel better as a result of it. And they also feel better if they're out in the open and walking around seeing things and being stimulated and educated. So I think the answer is there's quite a lot of benefits to humans to interacting with animals as well.